I don't know, uh, Jean, if I have a few minutes, can I just talk about some of the observations I had then Absolutely. at the time? I, um, I looked at... Uh, one of the issues that has, has fascinated me greatly is the, the distinction between genocide and crimes against humanity because both of those concepts actually emerged at about the same time during the mid-1940s. Uh, crimes against humanity, the term was, of course, used really for the first time in a legal sense uh, in the Charter of the Nuremberg Tribunal, which was adopted in August of 1945 and then was the basis of only one trial, the, the, the International Military Tribunal uh, trial, the Great Trial at Nuremberg. And it, just about the same time the word genocide started to circulate, it had been invented by a, a, a Polish Jewish law professor who had fled Europe and was then at, I think, first at Duke University in North Carolina and then at Yale uh, in Connecticut. And he wrote a book called Axis Rule in Occupied Europe. His name was Raphael Lemkin, and he wrote this book. And there's a chapter in there called Genocide. And he said, you know, we need a new a new crime. He was talking about international criminal law, and Lemkin was, amongst other things, a real pioneer in the discipline of international criminal law. So you, you have these two concepts floating around at about the same time, and uh, at Nuremberg they decide to go with crimes against humanity rather than the term genocide. The word was used a couple of times by the prosecutor, but it doesn't appear in the judgment. And, and yet we're really talking about the same the same event, we're talking about the Holocaust, when they talk about crimes against humanity. There are some other little pieces, you could say, of crimes against humanity, like the, the T4 euthanasia program and things like that. But, but really the core of it is the persecution of the Jews in, 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 in Germany, essentially, because the persecution of Jews in occupied territories was already covered by international law, by the, by the Hague Convention and by customary law uh, as uh, citizens in occupied territories. So, and, and of course, this was the problem they were trying to, to get at. In uh, 1944, uh, the Allies organized, or late 43, organized something called the United Nations War Crimes Commission. And uh, it was to do, initially, I think, I think the intent was to do exactly what the name suggests, to investigate war crimes, as they were traditionally meant or conceived of at the time. And uh, when they started meeting this body in London, um, NGOs started pressuring them, mainly Jewish NGOs, came to them and said, well, what are you going to do about, about the persecution of the Jews in, in Germany? And the answer from the, the senior lawyers of the Allies, particularly from the British and the Americans, was that's not covered by international law. We're not going to do anything. This is about war crimes. And what were war crimes? They were prisoner of war, abuse of prisoners of war, sinking, using submarines, sinking hospital ships, um, and various forms of, of abuse against civilians in occupied territories. That was the, the way they saw it. But over the course of the, the year and into 1945, there emerged greater support for the idea that they should also prosecute what they were then calling persecutions, deportations, and atrocities. That was the term. They hadn't yet, they hadn't yet given it a, a, a catchier name. And um, in the first draft, I checked this recently for a lecture I was giving, the first draft of the Nuremberg Charter, which was done by the Americans, this didn't appear. The Americans had gone back to really the classic war crimes concept, plus something else they were introducing, which was the crime of aggression or of crimes against peace. But, but the, real, the legal problem they were, that had to be addressed was, could you do anything about Nazi atrocities committed within Germany? Was that covered by international law? And... In the course of the conference that set up the Nuremberg trial, the, um, at one point, and he was the most candid, I think he was, he was a, really a fine person in many respects and had a great influence on the development of international criminal law, Justice Jackson, who had left the U.S. Supreme Court to come and, and uh, really construct the Nuremberg process. He was, the, he was in the drafting of the Nuremberg Charter, and then he went on to be the chief prosecutor at Nuremberg. And Jackson says, you know, he said, we have trouble with this concept of uh, persecutions, atrocities, and deportations because, he said, we have cases in our own country of persecution of minorities, and we don't want to be held accountable at international law for that. And I think he was being very candid, and he was saying what the others around the table, and then you only had the other three great powers, the Soviets, the British, and the French, and they wouldn't say it. 
because you know he was an American and he was a Democrat and he was he was he could say what was on his mind. But obviously the British are thinking, oh my God, you're right. What about India and Nigeria and Jamaica and Cyprus and Aden and you name it? And the French are thinking about Indochina and about Congo and about Algeria, and the Russians are thinking, you know, about about Chechnya and about all the other problem areas within the Soviet Union. And so Jackson says, you know, the only way we'll agree to prosecute Nazi atrocities committed against, against German nationals, that is within Germany, to consider that that's captured by international law, is if we can associate it with an aggressive war. And, and that's what international criminal lawyers now call the nexus of crimes against humanity. And they put that in to the definition. There's some debate about whether that's just, that was just a one-off, whether that was really the state of customary international law at the time. And some have said, well, but customary international law at the time didn't recognize the nexus. But I don't think that's a correct view because, well, first of all, there was no practice. There was no, there was no customary international law of crimes against humanity at the time. We, we have moral values and we could say that what, we're, what we call custom, crimes against humanity were evil, bad things, but there was no law of crimes against humanity. So I don't think it's, it's accurate to speak of that. And five years later, the UN General Assembly adopted its resolution on the principles of international law. And they called it Principles of International Law uh, in the Nuremberg Charter and the Nuremberg Judgment. And it was a General Assembly resolution. And it says quite clearly that crimes against humanity have to be committed in association with either war crimes or uh, crimes against peace. So they put the nexus in. And uh, I think I can understand perfectly why they put it in for the reasons that, General ja that Justice Jackson explained. That was confirmed by the judgment of the Nuremberg Tribunal. So although the great judgment of the International Military Tribunal talks at some length about the, um, about the atrocities committed by the Nazis prior to the outbreak of the war, nobody is found guilty for any crime committed prior to the 1st of September 1939, which is when the war breaks out. Well, and, and now I'm getting to the genocide part of it. What happened subsequently is a few weeks after the Nuremberg Judgment, which was issued on the 30th of September and the 1st of October, 1946, the General Assembly of the United Nations is meeting for the very first time. It's meeting in London that, that year. And some other countries, not the great powers, but what we would later call third world countries. Uh, India, India wasn't even an independent state at the time, but it, it was a UN member. India, Cuba, uh, Panama, and Saudi Arabia come to the United Nations and they say, we're unhappy with this concept of crimes against humanity because it doesn't acknowledge the fact that atrocities, persecutions, and deportations can be committed in peacetime. They're very dissatisfied with the so-called nexus linking crimes against humanity to armed conflict. And I can understand that too because they see themselves on the receiving end that we're still in a kind of a colonial and a, a colonized logic. This is the 1940s. And they see themselves as the third world being on the receiving end of the great powers and they want international criminal law to protect them. So they say, let's set aside crimes against humanity. We're not going to be able to do anything with that. That's already been a bit cast in stone at Nuremberg. And let's develop another concept. And they say, and they say it should be called genocide. And they, their draft resolution to the General Assembly says genocide, they define it and they say it must be defined as a crime that can be committed in peacetime as well as in wartime. And that is confirmed in the Genocide Convention. Of course, there's a price to pay for it. The definition of genocide in terms of the scope of the acts covered is considerably narrower than crimes against humanity. And over the next 40 years or so until, until I go to Rwanda in 1993 and then the year or two that followed, um, you have an uneasy relationship between genocide and crimes against humanity. Crimes against humanity able to cover a much broader range of acts of persecution, but limited by the nexus. That's being debated. It'll be debated now before the Cambodia Tribunal as to whether we know it was there in 1945. Was it there in 1975? We don't know. Um, and genocide, on the other hand, which is you know, the, the classic now human rights crime. It can be committed in peacetime by a state within its own borders and it amounts to the destruction of a, what we would call a, a national minority or an ethnic minority. It's a human rights crime and it's subject to international criminal law according to the convention. 
Of course, what happens then is quite dramatic. I'm talking now the 1990s. The International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia in its first judgment comes along and says, well, there's no longer a nexus with, with armed conflict and crimes against humanity. That's disappeared. And uh, they also, by the way, clarify this point that I referred to that, that arose on our mission in 1993. They say, and war crimes can be committed in an internal armed conflict as well as an international armed conflict. So the, what happens in the mid-90s is that there's a dramatic change in, in international criminal law in terms of the concepts of these crimes. My take on that, and, this is, and at the time of, I'm writing my book on genocide, is that now, that now that crimes against humanity can be committed in peacetime, the, the difficulties that led to the creation of the concept of genocide, the problem, no longer exists. So that it allows genocide to, instead of constantly being pressured as a concept to be enlarged and to be stretched to cover a ra much broader range of atrocities, which it had to do between 1948 and the 1990s, precisely because crimes against humanity had this fatal defect of the nexus with armed conflict. I thought, well, this is the time now when genocide can kind of come into its own as what it's supposed to be, as a very highly specialized crime, an, an aggravated form, if you want, of crime against humanity, which would be applied in the most extreme cases when there's the intentional destruction of an ethnic group, such as what I saw in, uh, in Rwanda and what we saw, of course, we saw the beginnings of it when I was there in early 93, and which, of course, the whole world saw in April, May, and June of 1994. Um, but the law, I would say, has, has not insisted upon that. There are some judgments from the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia that talk about genocide being a unique crime, or sometimes they call it the crime of crimes. But there's an, there are other tendencies in the case law to, to broaden out genocide. I, I, for example, was always skeptical about the applying the concept of genocide to the conflict in the former Yugoslavia, which I, I thought Yugoslavia, uh, the, the ethnic cleansing, which clearly took place in, in the former Yugoslavia, was much more appropriately described by crimes against humanity than by the crime of genocide. And of course, again, the judgments of the Yugoslavia tribunal have been, I think, uh, confused in this respect. Confused or, well, several of them have, have acquitted people of genocide um, in cases dealing with the camps, in cases dealing with the, with the ethnic cleansing that took place from 1992 to 1995. Of course, they then shifted gears and they said, yes, but the Srebrenica massacre of 1995 that was a genocide, but it was kind of a, a mini-genocide or a micro-genocide, if, if you will, um, because what we were really looking for was a, was a pattern, was a state policy of committing genocide, and the case law of the Yugoslavia tribunal has tended to suggest that there wasn't such a pattern, uh, and they even say in the judgment that talks about Srebrenica that, that there's not enough evidence that there was a plan to commit genocide, but that in the final days before the massacre at Srebrenica, a genocidal plan emerged, which is, um, you know, which tends to, to, um, to, to undermine the idea that there was some broader plan. I mean, we look at Nazi Germany and we see the plan going right back to, you know, Hitler's dreams while he was in prison in, uh, in 1924. So uh, this is some of the, the development in that law, and, and there's, there's still more to come because after the judgment on Srebrenica, that was in April of 2004 which um, was supposed to clarify, this was from the appeals chamber, so you know, an appeals chamber is supposed to clarify some of the uncertainty. But since then, there have been two judgments on genocide by the trial chambers, and they go in opposite directions. One of them follows the dissenting judge, Judge Shahabuddin, and the other, um, in the, this is the Brajanan decision, tends to go in the sort of the narrower, more conservative view of it. It would, would have been my preference, I suppose. And now we have uh, now this... this this interview, um, I don't know if I'm supposed to say when the interview is taking place, but we're here at the, at the beginning of February of uh, 2006, and in about two weeks, the International Court of Justice is going to begin its hearings in a case that was actually filed in 1993, uh, some uh, 13 years ago, by Bosnia against Yugoslavia, based on...